，就是有那种呃下雨跟什么温度低于几度的那种，还还有那种像威尔逊一样刻苦来上学。你今天气已经好很多了，还这样，可恶！我跟大家，嗯 ，talk about attendance <laughs> to encourage your attendance. But anyway, so what we're going to do, I think, is、um, hopefully today I'm going to wrap up chapter four. On the introduction of the device and some small analysis on circuit circuit part. So what we're gonna、uh, basically do a little review on what has already had has already been discussed、uh, la last、uh, on Tuesday, which is、um, we start understanding the basic operation principle of bipolar junction transistor. As I said, before by for for active anyway, this, these are all for active.、Uh, In active mode, so only active mode will we will will we be building these models and both the large signal and small signal. So th these are the models we establish. So there's this large signal. The top is for the large signal, and the bottom is the small signal. The yellow part is the part I would typically refer to as we call the first order model.、Uh, typically, when we address or analyze a situation, not necessary for device, but this is very, very often used when you analyze a circuit or you analyze a device. First, or you look at a, for example, a virus under microscope. What you do is that you start by Finding out where it is. So this is the same thing: is that when you view a device, what what we want to do is you capture the main、uh, behavior of the device. So this first order is simply describing the main operation or the main main component which、uh, construct the current in your system. So that's we call the first order model. So you want to. Capture the gist of how it functions and its basic operation, the key parameters, or key behavior direction. So once we have the larger picture, then you look in. So these white things, you see these? These are when you look in, and you see like oh, there's not only, for example, for coronavirus, you see like looks like a round thing, but that's the yellow model. So but when you look in, zoom in, and there's spikes and stuff. So There's details in the virus. That's the same thing. When you look in, it's not a, it's not a virus, but when you look in, you see details. So these details will then give you additional information as to when you operate under、uh, under a certain mode. These details will count, or these details will have significant impact on its behavior. Okay. So as I said, we already introduced the first order BJT model and the small signal. We,、um, these are typically referred to as the hyper pi model, and the reason、uh, that that is why the number the, the pi comes about. So you see, there is a definition on changing the voltage,、uh, the the resistance between B and E as R pi, and the voltage across as V pi. So this will also give us the naming convention, which will give us this.、Um, so today we're going to address. Additional, I wouldn't say too much into second-order analysis, but the non-ideal factor when this current source is no longer ideal, which means that it's no longer simply a current source. There's、uh, other dependency, which would then introduce this called output resistance. So this is、um, this actually come about because of what we call the early effect. So we're going to discuss secondary effects. And it's in fact so early fat would then lead to a non-ideal voltage control current source. This non-ideal current source then would then introduce a finite, we call it finite output resistance. So this would then lead to the introduction of RO. And then this is the only thing we're going to address as the second-order part. 
these parts, the, these, uh, these other parts, these are parasitic resistance RB, RE, RCs. And also, there is parasitic capacitance C pi C mu. We'll discuss those when we talk about frequency responses. So when, you, when we discuss how fast the transistor can transit, then these would then count. But if you're only looking at, if you're ramping your transistor at a very slow speed, whether they're ca they are carrying a bucket or not doesn't really make too much a difference. But if you're con considering speed, then th these buckets would then, count, count, uh, would then delay the speed of the operation. OK, so what we're going to do today is then we're going to first start by these. Th this is also still inactive. So all of the above are talking about devices, uh, especially MPN transistor in active mode. So these are also only valid when a device is operating in active mode. So the second thing we're going to do, of course, we're going to spend a little time. I don't want to spend too much time on those um, non-active mode, but I'm going to spend a little time talking about the second thing I'm going to talk about is saturation, of course, a little bit. When you operate in saturation, what happens? And of course, we're going to talk about a little bit on why. I, I already mentioned a few times that when you operate in reverse active, you get poor performance. I'm going to tell you why. And then finally, again, I'm going to spend a little time on, hopefully, we'll be able to save some time for PMP. The reason why I didn't start with PMP, there's also a reason, because it's, a, it's not very good in performance. So we're going to talk about that as well. These two are the same, because they're um, not uh, in terms of performance. They're poor. Therefore, it's not that critical in most of the amplifying uh, circuits. You won't, you won't pick a poor transistors. Or if, you, if there's a choice, you definitely put the high performance one rather than the poor performance ones. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, OK? So as we already, um, I'm going to start by giving an example. So let's say we start by testing the transistors, the output characteristics. We start with uh, looking at the output characteristics. So if this is my output current, I'm looking at, as I said, one of the testing conditions is that you want to look at if I'm applying different output voltage, what is its corresponding output current characteristic. So this is very important, the output characteristic of a transistor. So instead of having a voltage control testing system, another very commonly used testing system is by injecting current. So I could, instead of having the voltage, I could then set a different IB, OK? So this would then give me a better control, because I know that the collector current and base current has a constant ratio. So if I'm doing this type of testing or measurement, what can be expected will be a curve looking something like this. So this is very, very commonly used, uh, or if you see pictures uh, or characteristic of a technology or transistor. Th these are the typical uh, uh, characteristic of curves. So if you look at VL versus VO, so here VO is VCE, right? And IO is IC. So if I'm injecting a constant step of current, for example, if I'm ramping this, uh, not ramping, just set it at different level, for example, sorry, at zero, Let's say 1 microam, 2 microam, 3 microam. I'm just going to inject three conditions. So what we would expect is that the current, if I'm injecting 0, I'm expecting that there's no current. 0 corresponds to 0. So this is IB equals to 0. And then if I increase it, I'm expecting this would then rise to IB equals to like 1 microam. So I should be able to get something more like a equal step, because I'm injecting the same amount of beta, right? Uh, same amount of same step 
in the increment of base current. I'm stepping the base current. Okay? So if I'm doing this type of test, if I could actually refresh this. This gives me 0.3 milliamp, 0.2.1. If I give you this plot, you should be able to tell me what is beta. beta. What is beta? What is beta? The typical number. We have already used what is beta now. 100, correct. So now, just by measuring this, that's to say if you have a transistor, you want to know it's beta, this is the setting you want to use. OK, so this will then also tell us that this gives us beta of 100. This is what you would expect if you have a device with a beta of 100. For example, if you bought a device to give you the spec that this device has a current gain of 100, then you should test, test it under this uh, setting. OK, so this we already discussed. And one of the issue is that uh, one person called Early, his last name is Early. That is why Early effect is not, Early effect doesn't really, the Early is the name of the person. So one person started measuring this type of characteristic, and then he found that this is what you expect. Um, but what he actually measured doesn't look like this. It looks something more like, um, let me use, where's my, okay. So the real measurement, so let's say the green is what you expect. But then in his real measurement, it looks something more like this. Instead of having a flat line, so let me first set the boundary. Let's say this is my VBE. So I know that past this, I should be able to observe that this is inactive, right? So we know that inactive based on our first order model I should be seeing an ideal current source, meaning that the current will be set by base current under, so IC should equal to beta IB. So if I give you a constant current at the input, you should get a constant current at the output, which is independent of, of output voltage. But what happened is that this early person, he found that his measurement results indicate that the curve look more like this instead. So green is first order, and this is the real measurement results. If you actually get a device, so we assume that the green is what you project based on the model. So based on the model, it tells us that it's supposed to be an ideal current source, but it's not an ideal current source. So what he did was that in the maybe 70s, he doesn't actually spend much time in understanding what happened. But what he did is that, how do I actually use this in my circuit? How does that impact my circuit? I want to model it. So he used this most, um, I should say, non-pure non, uh, experimental method to do a curve fitting. So this idea of model this non-ideal characteristic is this. So he then, uh, let me redraw this again. So let's say if you're early, and then you found the curve looks something like this. Right? So the story is that this person found out that it's no longer a flat, let me redraw this. I'm not doing a very good job. So let's say this is the measurement results of this person. And then he found that it's no longer a flat line. So the, the, the idea is then if I'm measuring IC versus VCE, what happened is that it will then no longer, if I'm using the, the, the above model, which will only depend on VBE, it will no longer reflect the real collector current. 
So the idea is then, I'm just going to do a simple extrapolation. So his idea is that I'm just going to do an extrapolation of the line. So as I said, there's no physics in, in it. We're going to discuss the physics a little bit, the reason why it looks like this. But what he did was that how, how do I project or how do I model this characteristic? So the basic idea is then I'm just going to do an extrapolation. And then luckily, luckily, luckily these curves then coincide to each other and give a voltage, which is defined as VA. So VA is typically referred to as the early voltage. So I'm not talking about why yet. I'm still talking about what, you, uh, what has been observed and how does this person solve the problem of providing a more refined model. So the way of, re, uh, of providing a more refined model is then it's very, very rough. I'm just saying that he's using a rough model, but this is very useful when you have a rough model, meaning a simple model. It will then allow you to do uh, other projection into circuits, uh, circuit application much more easy. So we're not going to go into the detail as to what happened yet, but just to tell you then how he solved the problem. So he wants to refine the model. So remember, our previous model is IC equals to IS exponential VBE over VT, OK? So this is my original model. So the original model will give you the green line instead of the yellow, right? So you want it to more closer to the yellow line so that your prediction will not be off too much from the ideal uh, model. So what he added the correction terms. How does this one? How does one add a correction term? So the idea is very simple, is that I'm assuming that this level is very similar to the, this current level is very similar to this current. There's only a very small little gap. So this, there is a, as I said, it's a VCE set. So first of all, um, in most, if you do the measurement itself, you will see that this VCE set is typically very small. So meaning that this voltage, this, this um, current at this level and this level is very similar. So what he did is that use this current, assuming that they're the same. So this would then be this current, right? So he would, he would then get the projected level. So the projected level will be the slope. The slope would then be IC, I should say. Um, I'm just going to explain what happened. So the plus will be the flat line. And he add a correction term. How does one add a correction term? Meaning that the additional VCE, if you add additional VCE, it will then project it by the slope, which is IC over VA. So using this, I should say, let me rephrase this. So the way to do this is that I'm correcting this term by so I'm assuming IC, the real IC is IC without correction. So without correction plus a delta I. So how does I project the delta I? ICO will be the same, this. This is the ICO. This is the ideal model, right? So how does one project delta I? So delta I will be determined by the slope. The slope is this. I'm using the slope to project additional VCE. How does additional VCE increase the slope? So slope is defined by ICO. Uh oh, it's not Q. ICO simply means that there's no uh, the ideal first order model divided by VA times VCE. So he simply used this height to develop the slope and use the slope to project further down when you move to the, uh, when VCE increases. So let me just write down. So your corrected current will be, once again, ICO plus a delta incremental IC. So this will be, I'm assuming that this is flat, and this difference is delta IC. 
So this referred to ICO, right? I'm using ICO to project the slope using the additional VCE to project further downwards, okay? So then I'm just gonna write down the equation. This is exponential VB is still the independent VCE part plus the dependent part. So you're using ICO. I should just write ICO, actually easier. Sorry. So based on this, this equation, this is ICO plus ICO VA VCE, right? I'm just summing these two up. Sorry. So this would then give me ICO one plus VCE. Okay? So finally, uh, our equation would then become my original VBE dependency and then plus VCE dependency. So the refined model would then tell us that the collector current will be both affected by VBE and VCE. And the main control, of course, is still VBE because VBE is an exponential. So it has much, much stronger control on the overall current. But this would then still come in to lead to a small increment in current. OK? So this is just the derivation of the model we're going to use. And how does that impact our small signal model as well? We're going to talk about that a little bit. But before we go into that, uh, does anyone know why? This one just, so the whole discussion is that this person observed this and then you just use a model, you just establish a model and then refine the large signal model by introduce this correction term. That's basically what we already talked about, but why? Why? So I was trying to answer um, last week, uh, I think last time, a student asked me that I asked a question as to why is it flat? First, you, you ask yourself, why is, it, why is it a flat line? And then re, you revisit why it's not a flat line. Right? So you start by asking yourself, um, the reason we assume it's flat is because I know uh, my current. If you go back to the physics, the IC is the emitter current diffusion. Did I make any mistake? No. Is the diffusion current in base? In base. Okay, so it's supposed to be proportional to d and dx, the rest. So meaning that if you look at what happened physically, what happened is that if I have a B E junction, once again. Uh, B, eh, sorry, B, C, E. There's a four by SP injunction. So that I'm saying, I'm going to tell you that this will look like this, right? So this is my electron D and DX. On the left hand side, what determines D and DX? Once again, this is uh, on the, the pinpoint, your D and DX would depends on two point and the width, right? So your triangle, the, the slope would define by the triangle width. And then these two points. If I'm re reverse bias P injunction, as I said, our previous understanding is MP at WB and MP at zero. This will be MP zero exponential VBE. That's how the exponential VBE come about, right? And this is approximately zero. So you basically have the three points, the height, the difference, and the difference is fixed by VBE. And when you apply more bias, reverse bias, for example, if I'm increasing VCE, the problem of increasing VCE, what is VCE? VCE is VCB plus VBE. 
So I know that if my VBE is fixed, the increase of VCD, this is fixed, right? I'm assuming my base are fixed at a, a, a for example, the turnout voltage maybe point, point 0.8 volt. And I'm starting to ramp this, meaning that this would then imply your VCB increases. This is the reverse bias voltage, right? This is the reverse junction. So your VBC junction reverse voltage. which is the VR of the reverse bias PN junction. So as VR increased, what do you expect? This is already zero. You can put it down even further, but this doesn't really make too much difference. Uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.001 doesn't really ma make too much difference in this linear uh, projection. So what it does is that it will actually increase what? Remember the triangle, this, there's a depletion here. So I have depletion, right? This is the Na to Nd. I have Nd plus Na minus, right? So if I'm increasing this reverse bias PN junction, what do you expect? The depletion, the depletion region will grow. OK, so depletion will widen. So the key words is that it's going to be increased, so widen depletion. What does it mean is that I have a junction right here. Let's say this is my junction. This is the, the place of my junction. It would then deplete further down this way. This will also deplete. So it's like the vacuum in the back grow, expand further to the front. So what happened is that you will see your depletion grow a little bit. We didn't talk about this before because we didn't actually count the depletion at the beginning, at our first order. Just look at the first order behavior. But now if you zoom in, you will see that these depletion will grow, especially when the base width is small. If my base width is like, like 100 micron, I don't really care if it inches in a little bit. But if my base is only 0.1 micron, any interest would then, would then affect something we call, instead of having a physical WB, we then need to have to, de to define something called the, this is called the, let me use another. WB effective. So there's an effective WB. There's discrepancy between the effective and the real WB. So what is an effective WB? If you define this as X, we use our previous X. Uh, this is down to minus Xn. And, and I'm sorry, this XP and this X. This point will be x equals to xn. If I'm setting this to 0, then this will be x plus xn. This will be minus xp. So your final effective width. So what happened is that as, once again, as vce increases, under a fixed vbe, your vcb increase. Mainly, when we increase our output voltage or collector voltage, what happens is that your depletion region grows. The, the growth of depletion region will then lead to x. The depletion region grows a little bit. So then what happens is that your WB effective, and it says WB, I'm just going to roughly say that it's defined as WB minus XP will then decrease. So this would then lead to a increase of what happened? Therefore, this is a more hand-waving way of talking about why you see this rise of current. This is because this is, this is called either, there's two names for this. 
here is the early effect because the person early observed this. So typically referred to as the early effect, or another name is called the base width. This is more modulation. So this will give you the cost of y. So either way, these two are identical. These are talking about the same thing. Because as the base being modulated, your, your, um, your vacuum or the pump is pushing fo forward, or the extent of this pump being pu pushed forward, then the distance be for the minority character travel reduce, reduces. Therefore, it would then lead to an increase of collector current. Good. That is why, as I said, in the first order model, if I have a very, very wide base, what happens is that I will see a flat line because any additional depletion, I don't actually see too much depletion, and the voltage is dropped on where? I'm trying to answer the question. The additional VCE, uh, VCB, the reverse bias voltage is dropped on. Um, B, um, B, C junction. So if the growth is very limited, if I have a wide base, I don't actually see too much of a difference. And it, it still pinch my uh, uh, M, B, and W, B close to zero. That, that is why you see a flat line. Only when the effective distance changes, you will see the effect seeping up uh, under the early effect. Okay, I'm just trying to say that Additional voltage is being dropped on the depletion region. So the, the depletion region will eat up the voltage. But when it has effect in narrowing down your base, then you wouldn't see the effect, an early effect, or the base with modulation. So it's, it essentially reduces the distance between the diffusion of two points. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is then, OK, so this is the thing we already have our model. What is this implication? The most significant implication, other than projecting your DC current, you, you have to do a correction, meaning that maybe a 10%, 20% correction in the output, um, output current level. So I have the correction term, right? 1 plus VC over VA. Um, this is not the, the uh, key impact on the overall behavior. The key impact is actually at the output resistance. Because if you think about it, what does output resistance suggest? It suggests that, um, let me draw this. If I have an ideal current source, Let's say if I have an ideal current source, this is what happened IC versus VCE, right? So this simply implies that if I'm applying in a small signal domain, if I'm changing my collector voltage, meaning that if I'm modulating, let's say this is the same thing. This is VC, and if I'm having a small little VC changes, if I really have a flat line, what, it, what does it suggest? It suggests that it will not, so if I'm doing this projection, what is the delta i? If it's a flat, this would simply suggest that the delta i, delta ic is zero, right? If I'm applying a small little difference, Let's say this is my uh, VCE O Q. Let's say quiescent point. I'm moving a little bit on the right, moving a little bit on the left. If I have a flat line, it would simply say that I would then have a flat line. A, a, a flat line would suggest that even though I move around, the current will not change, right? Because of the flat line. So this would then equal to zero, and this would then suggest 
uh, something we refer as uh, an output resistance. We define something called the output resistance. If you define your output resistance, small signal output resistance, as 1 over d i where i o remember this is i o this is v o okay if this is the case i know since my denominator is zero this will simply give me infinite for ideal current source Right? Because this is an ideal current source. An ideal current source will give me infinite output resistance. My output resistance is infinite because the delta VIO is zero, even though I'm changing because it's flat. So now it's not flat. So then we typically refer this as a finite output resistance. Because if your RO is infinite on, on this model, you would then, you would then, because it's infinite, so that the resistance it's infinite, then it's open circuit, right? So now, because, because, of, because of early effect, we no longer, so we have to refine our model. If you ignore early effect, even though I have this RO, because RO is infinite, you can simply skip that because it's open circuit. But now, it's, uh, with, because of early effect, you have to have what we call the finite. Instead of infinite, you have a finite RO. So now the model will then consist of three parameters instead. Let me just, just highlight this V pi. So then I have three parameters, R pi, GM Okay? So instead of a two, then the model needs to expand to include output resistance. As I said, output resistance is defined as the inverse of the change when I modulate this. This is how you test it. You modulate from your initial point and then look at what the corresponding changes in your output current. And it turns out to be zero, therefore is infinite. But if, it's, if we're considered early fat, then the curve will look something more like this, right? The real curve will be the yellow one. OK? So if this is the case, what happens is that when I do the same exercise, when I'm wiggling around from my operating point, it will then reflect a smaller delta r. So delta IC is no longer zero. So that's the very, very important difference. Because in previous case, if, you, if we don't consider base width modulation effect, because of the flat line, you don't actually need to include this in your model. But now, because the finite resistance it will then need to be included. And it has significant impact on determined transistor amplification factors. So that is why it becomes much more significant other than this uh, DC correction. The correction on DC current would then affect your accuracy of your current. But this would then tell you the limitation as to the amplification of a circuit. Output resistance is very, very important. So what is the amount of output resistance? As I said, if you look at this, what is the output resist resistance? We can do it through the equation itself, or we can do it just simply when early model this. You simply model this by the slope, the inverse of the slope. So if I'm using the model, you can do it through the textbook, but we can actually, you can use that, you can insert that refined model into here and then get your output resistance. So RO, that once again, by definition, is dV the inverse of this. I'm simply going to insert that, and that will give me something Va over 
ICQ at, uh, sorry, at ICQ. So you simply do the uh, derivative and get that result. Therefore, um, wait, did I get it right? Inverse. There's an inverse in there. Therefore, your final results, let me write it in the left. So the RO will then become VA over I. The reference, um, all the small signal parameters will depend on your quiescent point, so ICQ. So once again, let me summarize the refined small signal model. I have GN, which is ICQ over VT. I have R pi, which is um, inverse GN beta. And then finally, alpha resistance is also dependent on your biasing point as well. OK? And this is very, very important. This would then limit your ultimate gain. I'm going to talk about that. Ultimate uh, performance of the transistor or technology. OK? Good. Any questions? So having the basic understanding of this will then help us um, move on to the oh, this this is this will conclude all the DC if if you're discussing DC circuits uh, or not uh, I should say we're not considering a parasitic capacitance effect as I said we're not talking about frequency responses then this is the model you need to use we're going to follow these models for follow-up circuit analysis in chapter five as well. But then before we go to chapter five, there's still a few loose ends, as I said, number two, three, four, um, on devices we haven't addressed. So I would like to spend probably the next hour also talked about um, these issues. So we're gonna go back to device physics and just to give you a brief introduction as to what happened during saturation, reverse active, and, P and a little bit, a little bit on PMP transistors, but um, I want to emphasize once again: in the following discussion, we'll mainly focus on these type of models and these analysis and uh, small signal models or large signal models for the follow-up discussion. We're not going to talk; you, you're not going to actually use too much, um, not really care too much about the two and the three because um, because um, if you're actually setting your device the wrong way, then your circuit may be in saturation or in reverse active. But if you're operating in the right direction, it should be at active mode and follow all these guidelines in analysis, OK? So even though I'm, I'm saying that it's not that important, it's still interesting understanding why or what happened during these, if you're operating in this mode, these modes. OK, so what we're going to do is um, talk about saturation. Saturation happens a lot more frequently than reverse active. Reverse active, you need to just connect your zeros and your, your, your upside down. It's more like an upside down problem. The saturation can happen fairly often in the circuit. Uh, even when you're designing the op, uh, a amplifier. So we're going to talk about what happened. So uh, what defines saturation is that when VBE and both junctions are forward. So based on this, these curves, these uh, analysis, it will happen here, right? So this will be. This version is actually we call the saturation version. If you in your output characteristic where you end, where we identify the saturation is that this is when V B C is um, is also 
Vc is larger than 0, right? Because this is VCE, so if it's smaller than this, you, if your VC is smaller than this boundary, then this would then 4 bias PN junction. So you 4 bias both junctions. So simply what happened is that if you look at this plot, um, I'm going to draw the plot. So let's say if this is the emitter base collector junction, I'm just going to just draw the junctions. And then what happened is that if you, uh, if you think about it, I'm going to use the red. I would then have two four bias VN junctions. So let's say I'm still having V. B E slightly higher than V B C. In most cases in saturation, even though one is four biasing, but this one is four biasing a little bit more, this is less. So if this is higher, for example, I'm just gonna give a number and I say this is 0.8, and this is maybe 0.1. So let's just look at the scenario. So what happened is that uh, let me draw the line and explain what I'm trying to say. So if this is saturation by definition, this is active, we know that the boundary is the VCE. We know that this is VBE. So let's say I'm fixing my VBE at 0.8 volt. I'm trying to reduce my collective voltage to lower than 0.8. So this is the line. This is the measured response. Let's say this is IC versus VC. I'm trying to explain what happened. OK? So if I'm sipping down here, let's say if I'm at this point, point 0.1, which is, this is already point 0.8. So at point 0.1, what happened is that you or originally we have this slope, right? So this is what happened when you have high high NP NP exponential. I should say NP at x equals to zero at a very fixed fixed four bias condition where it's controlled by VBE. Right? So this point doesn't change because my VBE is fixed. But on the left hand side, what happened is that you start by Rising this a little bit and four by this junction. So this will then be raised a little bit. But what happened is that if I'm only at point 0.1, which is, for example, maybe 0.7 volt, if this is the 0.7 volt point, th the way to think about this is that even though I'm raising on the right hand side, be but, but because of the exponential term, so this is the NP. WB. We're not considering modulation effect. So this will be NP0 exponential VBC. OK? So what happened is that first, we need to recognize that uh, it will raise whatever. Um, you now start to pump a little perfume from the back. So you're raising your minority carrier concentration at the collector side as well. But even though that happens because the exponential, if you use the number, this is 0.8, and you use 0.1, there's a significant difference between the two. So this would then lead to something if, if VB, um, I should say, if VBE is still larger, larger than VBC, what happens is that NP0 is still larger, larger than NP at WP. Now, as you say, you don't actually see the rays when it happens. Okay? So only when, so let me just write down. So dn, what you can actually do is that do the exercise on your own. So dn dx becomes WB exponential both side uh, VBE. So it's a competition between the two four bias. Oh, NP 
They open NP So you will see the rise when it's close enough. Meaning that if you if you're actually closer, for example, you closer to maybe 0.4 volt. At 0.4 volt, which means that the difference between the two become 0.4. So that you actually see the difference. Therefore, you see the small, you start to see the drop. So at 0.2, for example, 0.2 maybe when BE minus BC, typically when it's smaller or equal than 0.4, NP B over NP0 becomes significant enough. This is simply because of the exponential. I want to say again, this is because of the exponential nature of the thing, the pot uh, potential, potential exponential dependency on its minority carrot concentration. Therefore, if it raises a little bit, if there's large difference, you don't actually see the impact. When it raises to a certain level, what happens is that this would then raise to here. For example, will be more flattened at point 0.2. So this is at point 0.2. So then you see significant difference in the gradients. Okay, so this is one impact. Another impact is, have you thought about what happened to the base current? During, um, during saturation, this junction doesn't change. So I'm still having to support uh, this diffusion current, IH, in emitter. But if you think about the collector, what happened at the collector? The collector will be four bias as well. When the collector is four bias, it will be higher. It will be something more like this. So what happened is that even though the collector is pretty wide, but to a certain extent, this level, the n, the p, n, 0 at collector. I want to say this. Um, let me write it here. P n 0 at collector will be much, much larger than P n 0 at emitter. Right? Why? Why do I draw the big chunk of hole current, hole, ho uh, holes in the collector? Because collector is much more lightly dealt. R remember, remember the level. Let me just give a number. This is a, a typical number. Is this is 10 to the 19. This is maybe 17, and this is 16. So this is um, how much? Three order of magnitude lower. In a doping concentration. So I'm just trying to emphasize that this is because NC is much, much lo lower than NE. Therefore, you would then have a lot more minority carrier concentration when you four bias. So it's very costly. What happened is that the most significant thing, other than the drop in collector current, is the raise of base current. So what happened is that you will then see significant raise in base current because my base current, IB, then has to supply both sides, in the emitter and the collector. Both the emitter. Let me use E instead of. In both, in both the emitter and collector. Um, collector. And this will be much, much larger because we didn't suppress it with heavily doped uh, structure. Okay? So you will see a lot of minority carrier coming in, and you have to supply both sides. So your base current would increase significantly during saturation. This is one of the two effects. Once again, reduce the reduction of uh, 
the reduction of gradients is the, one of the key uh, feature of have the, do, uh, in saturation is the raise of uh, minority carrier concentration at the back when we're pumping, also pumping uh, electrons from the back. The other thing is that you then have significant rays of base current because your four by is both junctions. So you need to supply both. And this will be much more significant because emitter has been deliberately suppressed. The whole current has been deliberately suppressed because I heavily doped this. This is deliberately done. But this is a side effect we can avoid. OK, so let's take a break for 10. And we're going to dispense the um, quizzes. Mm-hmm.
Okay, um, let's continue our discussion uh, today. So, well, after talking about saturation, so one of the key important uh, parameters other than, I want to make a correction on, on the, the previous slide, which um, previous lecture, which I made a mistake on highlighting the output resistance. So, Uh oh, GM B pi R pi. So GM, the key parameter is GM. GM is VT uh, over IC Q. And uh, R pi is GM. It's theta over GM. And then finally, uh, output resistance, there's an additional parameter, which is early voltage. So in finding this, you will then need three more parameters, which is uh, two more parameters, beta and VA. So this will typically be provided to you um, in, in a device model. So you will then know that your early voltage, what is the early voltage, and then we can calculate output resistance as well as uh, allow us to find R pi, beta and G B A. One of the key important things you need to understand is that uh, I want to just extend a little bit on the discussion of early fat is that when WB decreases, what happens is that this is called a narrow base device. The reason we want narrow base, of course, is then it would then it would then lead to, a, yes? Oh, sorry. Yeah, correct. Okay. I'm going to B, B, C. Okay. So when you narrow down the base, a narrow base device will then give us one of the key parameter we want to obtain is actually increase of beta. So this will then allow us to have a good current gain because you narrow down the base. But then the side effect is that your VA will also decrease because it will make the slope, it will make it um, early effect more significant, more prominent. If you think about early voltage when VA if I say a VA approaches infinite, that simply means that no early effect, right? Because my, uh, my voltage is at the ultimate end, so you don't actually see it. But when early voltage shrink, that simply means that your slope actually increases, so more significant early effect, right? Modulation effect. That would happen when base decreases, base width decreases. The other thing is that um, the other part that would affect this is base doping. So to increase beta, remember what, what determine beta or determine IS is inverse proportional. So if I'm, I'm writing the IS. So writing down IS is inverse proportional to MBWB. So let's say if I want to increase my IS, one is reduce WB, the other is reduce MB. So let's see what happens when you reduce MB. This is the lighter base. If I want to make a description, is that if I'm using a lighter base, the base is lightly doped. So this will also increase my beta if um, the other structures remains the same, my emitter collector remains the same. So what is the impact? What do you think? You think your early voltage will what? What do you expect? It will increase or decrease? Remember, the base width modulation is the depletion. So by applying the same voltage with a lighter doping, meaning that it will deplete more or less. Lighter doping will then. deplete more, right? So when it deplete more, it will be more significant. So this will also decrease, meaning that your output resistance will decrease as well. 
So this is the same direction. If you want to increase your beta, beta and early voltages are sort of like a trade-off. If you wanted to increase your beta by engineering your base, these two directions will both lead to more significant early effect or, or reduce of alpha resistance. Okay. So let's come back to saturation. I want to highlight one important thing. So one of the key, what you need to learn about saturation is, once again, let me uh, summarize it, is that it will then lead to IC reduce in saturation as VCE decreases. As VCE decreases, and what, when will we, you see this? In typical cases, we'll see this when VCE is smaller than VCE set. So what defines VCE set? VCE set is v, we want to know the difference between base and collector voltage. So base and collector voltage will be B, BE minus VCE set. So this will be somewhat ab about 0.4 volts. And this, this voltage come about because of the exponential nature of that equation. So if you just think about uh, it, it depends on Vt, of course. But the, because of the exponential nature, if it's close by 400 millivolt, then you will see significant uh, difference uh, in, in the gradients of d and dx. So that is why typically. If, you're, if you want to define VCE set, we'll typically define as VPE on minus a 0.4 volt. So let's say if my VPE on is set to 0.4, then VCE set is typically at 0.4 volt. So this will also typically be given to you in the question. So these are also device parameters will be given to you. So VB on and VC on are both limiting where uh, the operation region are. OK, so this is typically we use to define whether it's inactive or in saturation uh, for in circuit analysis, not describing what really happened in the dial. So real saturation and Circuit saturation, this is typically referred to as the circuit saturation, when you see the difference in collector curve. OK? So the next thing I want to uh, spend a little time on is we still have um, two more topics. One is reverse active. I'm only going to talk about this very briefly because, as I said, this is mainly because you connect to your circuit round. So let's spend a little time and discuss what is re what's the definition of reverse active and and what happens, uh, what is the um, beha uh, behavior. So let's think about reverse. In reverse active mode, what it means is that I have VPE in reverse, VPC forward. I have one junction for uh, the other junction for the B BC junction for and BE junction reverse. So what happened is that you also still look at the minority carrier concentration distribution. What happened is, th is that it will look a little bit like that, but you then have something like this. So this is E, B, C again. So I will then form my BC junction. So I'm just going to uh, highlight the doping concentration once again. <coughs> so let's say this is 10 to the 19. You already dope your device. when you, The device are already made, right? So this is 17, this is 16. This is N, B, and C. So what happened is I'm raising this minority. So this will be very similar to that, just in reverse. So I'm reverse by this junction, so this will be down to 0. So then my MP at WB will be the highest MP0 exponential. Okay. 
So basically, what happened is that your collector current, or I should say, it become emitter current. The emitter current, if I'm drawing my emitter current in this case, this is my emitter current. So my emitter current is will then become is exponential VPE over VT. So it's identical. to active, inactive the IS. It's the same as IC in, act, in inactive. So there's no loss in this, in creating the electron current. So your electron current is the same. So we actually have the same D and it's just reverse direction. And this is the electron current component, right? The electron current is identical because your base is identical. But the only difference is that what is the cost? The cost of four biasing this junction is that I need to supply a lot of whole current, a lot more, right? So then you expect that you would then have a, this is your whole, uh, whole density, so this would then create a whole current. Where does this whole current come out? This whole current would depend on Inverse IC L, I should say LP. Because we don't have a narrow emitter or narrow emitter, uh, we, we don't have a very narrow emitter. Therefore, you cannot use WC because WC is very, very long. Remember, it's down all the way down to the well. So you have to use diffusion, the diffusion, we call it uh, diffusion lens of. of holes in collector. But that's not a very important. What, one of the key important thing is this. Because we have a very lightly doped collector, therefore, your IH will be much, much larger. IH uh, in active. Remember, the IH in active is inverse proportional to NC. Remember our exercise, right? So this will be much, much larger because collector is lightly doped. Therefore, you would then have very poor beta. Typically, what happens, if you look at this, what is beta? If you think about that, when I talk about saturation, is that beta is a portion of the red part against the green part, uh, the, the, the blue part. So as long as my in original operation, remember I have a large red part, which would then create a large collector current, electron current. I want large electron current, smaller whole current. In this case, I have a larger electron current. So what happened is that my electron current component will be larger than whole current component. This would then lead to typically a beta this R stands for in reverse active will be typically lower than one. So this is actually what we actually don't want is because as I said, current gain is a gain. You're not getting anything. You're getting less than one, meaning that whatever you put in is larger than whatever is being taken out. Okay, so if I'm operating in reverse active like this, I can still operate in reverse active. Um, let's say it's very hard because <laughs> it typically wouldn't work this way. So let's say this is forward active. This is forward. In reverse, what happens is that you flip the device, so you this represents your, it will be something more like this. So if I'm, if I'm putting this at a high voltage, say, let's say VCC, this is 0.8. If I operate this way, this is zero volt. So this is called a reverse active. This is forward. So VC larger than zero, BE smaller than zero. That's called the reverse. 
So in reverse active, my output current is this, right? This is my output current IO. So whatever uh, my putting, the, the main reason is that the IO is identical. So whatever I'm putting in, the IB is much, much larger than if I'm operating in active mode. So I'm paying too much input. Therefore, I will get, be getting a gain of less than 1. This will be defined as I in over I B in reverse active. OK? So for current gain less than 1, it doesn't really help you anything. It doesn't, you're, you're paying too much. And then it will then lead to very poor transistor or amplification uh, performance. Therefore, this is typically, you want to avoid that, or you want to avoid <laughs> misconnecting your circuits. OK? Yes. <coughs> Which one? MP. Three. Oh, you said this one. This is this should be BC, right? You said it. It should be BC. I think it's just if you flip it over, so you flip it over, BC is BE. It's just naming problem. Yeah, it should be BC. Because I define this one as BC. Yeah, this one is 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 BC. So this is MP0. I'm just simply saying that it's because anyway, if you're four biasing a junction, the four biasing would then dominate your highest, uh, uh, highest minority carrier concentration at the, at the boundary. So you're right, this is VBC. Identical to if this is when you assume VB equals to VBC when you're operating in a reverse direction. So you are still apply 0.8 at VBC. So comparing for and reverse, this, if I'm setting this to 0.8. So I'm, if I'm putting a identical device, but simply flip emitter and collector, and ha uh, uh, um, apply the same type of biasing on, on, on top, then it will be identical. The current itself, the current level will be identical. The main reason is because your base is the same. Remember the emitter, the collector or emitter current, because this is reversing, but the main current passing through the, if you're operating in, we call the active mode, even for reverse or for active, doesn't really matter. Whatever the current, it will depend only on the base structure when we derive, remember when we derive IC, it only depends on base structure. So because the base is identical, is supposed to be the same. It should be followed the same. The IS is the same. This is what I'm trying to say. OK? But, but you're applying, you're, you're using VBC as VBE when you flip the emitter and collector. OK? Good? So we have uh, one last topic to to discuss, uh, to wrap up the whole chapter. So that's PMP transistor. So if you want to talk about a PMP transistor, in a PMP transistor, what actually happened is that um, it's actually, I'm just going to talk about active. It's the same. So you have P. And P transistor. So the main difference is that we're going to reverse the types. So when I four bias PN junction, what happened? This this will be my EBC. So when I four bias EB junction, this will then lead to the main current will be DPDX through the base, and then my My base current will be D and DX, will be depending on emitter's electron current. So the collector current will be determined by 
dp dx in base. Therefore, it will be proportional to, because it's whole current in base. So it's whole, I should say whole, this simply say whole diffusion. dp dx is just short for whole diffusion current in base. Therefore, because it's whole, so it depends on whole mobility, and the diffusion structure will then um, allow us to set that the doping level will be inverse proportional to mb. And the distance is wb will then determine inverse proportional to the gradients. Okay? So that's what we get, collector current. And the base current is determined by d and dx in emitter. OK? So in, for d and dx in emitter, what happened is that it would then put be proportional to mu n because it's an electron current. So it's electron diffusion in emitter. Let me write it down. It's electron diffusion in emitter. Therefore, it will be proportional to its mobility because it's electron current and inverse proportional to emitter doping and emitter base. OK? So as I talk about the, the um, current gain for PMP transistor, it will then be the ratio between NE over NB. We over Wb, mu p over mu n. Right. So what happened? Why is it? Uh, why doesn't we pick the PMP transistor? So for the same discussion, if I have the same doping level as an MPN counterpart, so this will be the same thing, the same doping level, and the same Wwe Wwb. W E W B ratio. If this remains the same, if these are the same to the MPN counterpart. So if I make an MPN with the same ratio and emitter base ratio and uh, emitter base doping concentration, I want you to compare a MPN. I should use the PMP on top. So if I want to compare the two, what is the ratio depends on? All the, all the device structure doping concentration are the same. So you cancel each other, and you get a mu p over mu n squared. OK? So what it means is that it gives you an attenuation of about 1 fourth to 1. Uh, this, this is about one fourth or depending on the ratio. If the ratio is uh, one third, then you get one ninth. So that, that means that if I'm if I'm assuming that so four mu p over mu n equals to one half and beta for a beta MPN with the same structure of a hundred your beta PMP will be twenty four. The same structure, the same technology, you're making the same structure, the same doping, nothing changed. But simply because the type of carrier become, the main reason is that my main conducting current carrier is whole. The price on pay is electron. Because electron move faster, therefore, it would then lead to a discrepancy. Uh, main, uh, I should say, twice penalty on the ratio between base current and uh, collector current. Therefore, you will then have much less current gain in a PMP transistor. OK? But then um, we can still construct its model. Its model will be the same as an MPN transistor. But um, let me see if I want what I want to talk about. Okay, 
So the operation of an MPN transistor it will be more like this. Uh, a PMP, sorry, a PMP transistor will be more like this. Um, four bytes in this junction. I can still have it operated this way. And then this is typically how you operate as a comma emitter because this will be at a high voltage. This will be VCE. This will be your VBE. And this is my collector current. So collector current will still be my alpha current. So this is when at four bias disjunction, reverse bias disjunction. This is for, for a PMP. And a, um, active. And it's active mode. Okay? So that's how we do the biasing. But the equations are basically the same. If you want to write down the large signal equation, it will be there's simply some little correction on the voltages. If you want to make your voltage positive, it will be EB as positive. I should say this is the EB. So then. This is VEB. I want, if I'm using the positive voltage to, to define, this will be VEC. So this is EBC. So it will be VEB over VT, 1 plus. For the early effect correction, it will be the same. Instead of, if you want to all use all positive numbers, just use EB and EC rather than C. That's just to make sure that your voltage is always reflected as positive. Okay? So um, I would like to go through a simple example now. Let's see. So that you get a sense as to how does one analyze a PNP transistor in circuit. So let's go through maybe two, we might have time for two examples. Okay. So let's go through an example of a PMP transistor. This is also a common emitter stage. It's just I'm using a PNP instead of a MPN. So if it for common emitter operation, you simply, this will be my highest voltage. This is VC. Um, yeah, 2.5. And then this will be my collector resistance because I'm in reverse. And let's say if this is the output, this will connect it to ground. If I'm using a PMP transistor, and this is connected to a resistance and then a fixed bias of 1.5. So if I give you this um, circuit, I would like you to do two things. One is to find out, first of all, to find out ICQ, your operating point. And second is to construct the small signal model. So to construct a small signal equivalent circuit. But first of all, um, I would like to, uh, I need to give you the device parameters. So in this case, we're going to use the constant voltage model. So for Q1, instead of have VBE on, we have VEB on, which is 0.8 volt. 
So instead of using an exponential model, we're going to use the constant voltage model. And then, of course, there's the beta. As I said, beta will be a lot smaller, so I'm going to use 25. So you have a very small beta. OK? So first of all, um, what is, um, I want to find out the DC biasing point of my output as well, yeah. So first of all, how does one find ICQ? We're using this pathway. We know that this is a constant voltage, so this voltage across is VEBR. So through this path, I should be able to identify what is my base current, right? So the amount of base current, IB, will be determined by VCC minus VEB on, VEB on minus 1.5 volt. That's the base bias divided by the resistance, RV. So I have 2.5 volt minus how much? This will be 2.5 minus 0.8 minus 1.5. And this will be RB. RB is 10 k ohm. So I forgot to get RB here. It's 10 k. And RC here is 3 k ohm. So these are given. So we should be able to find out what is the base current first. Once we know the base current, base current is 20 micron. So by this biasing setup, I should be able to identify the amount of my base current. Once the base current is given, the next thing is then, what is the collector current? Collector current at quiescent point will be IB times beta. So this will give me 500 microamp, which is 0.5 milliamp. OK? And the next thing is that you want to make sure that this device is operating inactive. Otherwise, this equation is no longer valid. So we find out what VL is. VL would then be uh, IC RC. So this is 0.5 milliamp times 3K. This will be 1.5. So this will then give us VCE equals to 1 volt, which is larger than VEC set. This is the same as VCE set. Um, typically, anyway, it's larger than VEB. So we know that it's larger than, if I want to give you a number, so VCE set, typically 0.4, not, if, if it's not given. So we know that it's in saturation, uh, it's inactive. So this would then tell us that Q1 is in. The next thing is that we need to construct a small signal model. I didn't actually spend too much time on talking about how the small signal model for the MPE and the difference between the two. The reason is that it's the same. <laughs> uh, what, what I mean by that, mean by that is that um, if you think about it, when I modulate so I could I should be able to construct my small signal models, GM, B pi, for a PMP transistor, because it's, it's, small signal and, uh, it's a small signal model, so it doesn't have a direction problem. Because either direction, as long as if I'm modulating this, this two terminal, even though it's EB modulating this, if I'm flipping the direction, it will cancel itself. Therefore, it actually had the identical model as an MPN. So 
If I want to construct, I'm simply insert this. This will be my emitter terminal. Emitter terminal will be ground because emitter terminal is VCC. VCC is AC ground. So if I want to construct my small signal equivalent model, I'm simply inserting the identical MPN small signal model. They, they are identical. MPN and OPMP are identical. And then my input terminal will be this. RB. This is my small signal model. And my output terminal is collector. So collector is connected to RC. So this will then be my small signal. equivalent circuit where you can find the r pi following our previous analysis the same so r pi gn ro can be found based on ic or icq okay so if i give you an early voltage you should be able to find ro if early voltage is not given you can skip this part if early voltage is infinite, then RO is infinite. So then this can be skipped. OK? Yeah. I don't know if I have, to, I have time for a more complicated circuit. So let's try to go through another circuit. That's, um, even though I'm um, using the PMP transistor comma emitter stage, but um, in real practice, this is very, very rare. You wouldn't use a PMP transistor for this purpose. But another circuit is probably um, if you're using a pure P a BJT based circuit, this will be a uh, somewhat common circuit. So we, let's uh, spend a little time on this example. So I'm going to talk about another example which PMP is used instead of an active amplifying transistor is used as what we call a loading device. So I want to go through another example, which is a comma emitter stage. We're going to talk about this more when we talk about a uh, different type of um, amplifying structure. But I'm simply going to tell you when you will see a PMP transistor. This is more common than the, the example I use on the left. So what is a comma emitter stage of an MPN? Let's say this is my uh, transistor, Q1. This is the MPN transistor, which we then, we have already analyzed before. If you remember, I have a bias. I have a signal, and then this will be my output. Right? Remember, when we deliver the circuit, we simply add a loading resistor, which is an RC, on top. But instead of having an RC, the, one of the things uh, you need to understand is that an integrated circuit um, is very hard to deliver a passive component. It's very costly. So if you wanted to deliver a loading, it's the load simply meaning that I want to transform current into voltage. I use a volt, I simply use a resistor. But instead of a resistor, we're going to use a PMP transistor. So this is a PMP load. This is referred to as a PMP load. So this is called a comma emitter. This is a comma emitter stage with a PMP load. So this Q2 will then become the Q2 will then serve as a loading device. OK? So this is much more common it's because you want to deliver all the components using transistors instead of having introducing passive components such as having a resistor. 
So, uh, and this will then give you additional benefit. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, in the uh, next chapter. But then, um, how does one analyze this problem? So, let's give some device parameters. IS1 equals to IS2. These are two transistors. We're assuming that it has the same IS. And beta 1 is for Q1 is 100. Beta 2 is 50. And I have early voltage VA1, VA2 equals to 20 volts. So these are the device parameters we use for the circuit. So there's two things we want to find. We want you to design VB1, VB2. Determine VB1 and VB2 so that IC1 equals to IC2 equals to 1 milliamp. So you want to set your um, operating point or oper biasing current at 1 milliamp by adjusting the, these voltages. And it's supposed to be balanced. The top and the bottom should be balanced itself. And then, of course, the next thing we want to know is small signal. You want to know VL versus VS which is the AVO, the voltage gain. Open circuit voltage gain. The O stands for open because we're not adding any loading to the circuit yet. OK? So let's see how we approach this problem. I might need to borrow maybe Five to ten, maybe five. Hopefully, we can go fast. Okay, let's take a look at the how does one do the biasing? The biasing part is fairly simple. What we basically want to follow is the, the guidelines that uh, the current should balance, the current level and the, the current balance itself. So VBE, VB1 equals to VBE1. We're supposed to be VT ln. If my desirable current, IC1 divided by IS. This will give us about 0 .1, 0 0.78 volt. So you set it up at 0 0.78 based on this device parameter. It should deliver 1 milliamp. You insert the numbers. And of course, VB2 equals to VCC minus VCB2. And this will be 3 volt minus uh, VT. Ln IC2 IS. Since IC2 is 1 milliamp, we know this is what we want. This is device parameters 10 to the minus 16. So we should be get we should be able to get the voltage level. The DC voltage level at VB2 should be about 2.2 volt. So these are just simply DC biasing, allowing you the circuit to be set to its particular location. The, the particular level. The second part is a little bit more complicated. So we need to, when we want to do the small signal analysis, we need to construct the small signal equivalent circuit. So let me draw the whole circuit. There's two transistors. So it's somewhat a little bit more complicated. But let's first draw Q1. So there's R pi 1. And GM V pi. Because I have two, so it's it's probably safe to keep it with the notation. This is GM one, V pi one. And then it's connected to a output resistance R O one. So the the white part is for Q one. Let me change the color to Q2. 
So I have connected this to the collector. So you start with the, you flip the transistor and connect it to the collector. So this will be RO2. GM2 V pi 2, right? So all the, if you look at this, this is the base. Base is connected to signal source. Mm -hmm. Different color. So this is my input source. Yes. And this is the em emitter terminal. Emitter is grounded. And the other side of the emitter, remember, this is the collector. Um, this is collector one. This is collector two. So collector one and collector two are connected, right? So the collector terminals are connected, and the emitter terminal for PMP transistor are grounded, AC ground, it's VCC. So this is ground. So you can assume that they are ground. This is VCC which is AC ground, again, small signal. OK? And lastly, I have this terminal connected to a R pi 2, E pi 2. Now, what happened to its base? Where does it go? VB2, VB2 is AC. It's also ground. So this is connected to ground. This is VB2, which is also AC ground. So you're grounding all the three DC components. The real ground, which is the emitter. The emitter one is the real ground. And you have the AC ground of the emitter two. And this is emitter, uh, this is base two. And all of them being rounded. OK? So this is my equivalent circuit. So I can quickly simplify what happened on the right is because what is V pi 2 in this case? Because it's ground, this means that V pi 2, this means that the voltage across V pi 2 equals to what? There's no small signal modulating the base current. Is, the base voltage is fixed. So V pi 2 is 0, meaning that this is 0. This is open. So you're only seeing, you don't need the, the right-hand side. That's all you see. OK? So when we look at this circuit, we can very quickly get our output response based on this circuit, based on this, this part. Because you, on the right-hand side, it only contribute RO2. The PMOS load only contribute RO2. So what happened is that you would then get your output. This is the output. This common node is my output. So my VL will then become current, which is minus GM V pi 1, GM 1 V pi 1 times R01 in parallel R02, two in parallel. So then this will be minus GM1. What is V pi 1? V pi 1 is Vf. So GM1, R01 in parallel R02, uh, Vs. So my voltage, again, defined as the ratio between Vl versus Vs would then be minus GM1, R01 in parallel R02. OK? And because we know that it has the same early voltage, R01 actually equals the same as R02. So you, we can actually do the exercise to find R01 and R02. Let me just get the numbers. So um, GM, in this case, let me write down this. So AVO here is minus GM1 RO1 in parallel RO2. Because they have the same current and the same voltage, so RO1 
equals to RO2 equals to, they have the same current, so VA divided by ICQ. This will give me 20, I believe 20K. Do I have it? Yeah, 20 volts, so that's 20. Okay? And then, this is the same, because they are the same. And GN is um, ICQ DT. So I can get the numbers, but I don't want to um, get the <laughs> final result, IC1. I'm just going to use IC1 because they're the same. IC1 equals to IC2. Okay, so if I'm some, uh, simplifying this equation, this will be minus GM, uh, GM1 times one half RO, which will be minus one half GM is IC1 divided by VT. RO is VA divided by IC1. The reason why I'm keeping this instead of inserting the number is because the current cancels itself. So then you get a constant ratio of minus VA divided by VT. That would be the overall gain. So the gain would depending on only two things. One is early voltage, the other is the thermal voltage. So that's your, uh, we typically refer that into the intrinsic gain. That's the intrinsic gain of the circuit because that's what's limited by its own component, meaning that it will be depending on its upper resistance and its transconductance itself. It's, it's not depending on external resistance. It's more internal technology limited behavior that will limit your overall gain, ultimate gain. We typically refer to that as intrinsic gain. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But that's just to tell you that when you will be using PMPN, what is the active load will then lead to the, the introduced introduction of having a resistor um, contribute a resistant component or loading component that will lead to the limitation of your overall gain of the circuit. Okay? So I think I'm just going to stop right here uh, regarding the discussion of Chapter 4. So we're going to continue on more discussion on circuit analysis rather than the device part. So you leave the dis device part with the models, exponential model or VBL model, constant voltage model, and small signal model. We're going to use these models to bridge into the discussion of different type of circuits and how does it reflect its uh, behavior. What do you want to deliver? So we're going to talk about, instead of only talking about amplifying, this is the, the most, I think the key prompt, uh, the key performance is to deliver something called a signal amplification. Remember, we want to create again. The other thing you want to create is buffering signal. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more later in classes. So we're going to start talking about the use of the power of the power. The use of the power of the 呃，你可以想象，就是房子除了住人呢，还要有有什么，有一些 buffer 区间了。所以，我们其实很大一部分要做界面了。就是你在处理讯号的时候，你通常除除了处理讯号，主要把讯号放大之外，其他很多的工作是，你确定你拿过来的是真正的讯号，没有在这个过程中，呃，被扭曲。那这个不要被扭曲这件事情呢，就要靠非常非常好的界面。所以我们还是介绍一些界面电路，像 follower circuit， follower circuit 非常非常非常的好，非常非常重要，而且非常非常非常非常好用这样子。大家如果你的手机里面有百万画素的相机，那个叫什么？呃，呃，百万对百万像素、百万 pixel 的相机的话，你就有一百万个 buffer， 你就需要 buffer， 然后就所以所有的 sensor circuit 都需要 buffer。所以我们会讲这个 buffer 的应用非常的重要。所以除了放大就是 buffer。所以我们在后面会讲这些不同不同架构的应用跟它的 impact impact。好
那我们就是，所以元件的部分就到这边，我们就会用这个 model 去讨论电路的应用。